we welcome you this morning and we'd like you to stand with us as we sing I will call upon the Lord and remember this is a round and the guys y'all lead it the ladies will follow okay here we go I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemy I will call upon the Lord again I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from my enemy I will call upon the Lord the Lord and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted the Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted okay here we go the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. We'll have to get Terry a chiropractor now. <laughs> Our next song is Holy Spirit, Thou Art Welcome. <laughs> that we mean that as we sing that amen and i'm also thankful that if uh, we make him welcome he will show up amen and you don't have to look too hard for him either that's the great thing and uh, so thankful that god is on our side and a friend of sinners amen and uh, looking forward to our service today let's look to the lord in prayer this morning ask his blessing service. but bob would you open us up some more please Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We are glad that you are here today. As always, looking forward to a good service and just allowing God to work in our hearts and our lives and making sure we give Him the preeminence. Amen. And looking forward to that today. Do we have any very first time guests? Very first time in one of our services. We want to welcome you this morning. We will not make you give a speech. No? No first, very first timers? All right. How many old timers do we have? <laughs> amen amen well whether you're a first uh, second timer or a third timer or a 197th timer we are glad that you are here um i thought i'd show you this today i got a, a new pair of socks i got some socks last week um some fourth of july socks so i'll wear those next sunday for fourth of july these are uh, that's a that's a real picture of my feet <laughs> I'm almost scared to put them on. My, my, anyways, but uh, thank you for those, and uh, we'll we'll put those to good use. Amen. Put them on my smelly feet and help cover that up. But uh, 
Again, we're glad that you're here today. We do have something a little bit different at this point of the service before we have Kathy come and make our announcements, but today's a special day. Uh, as always, whenever we have this, is a special day, but we have a baby dedication today, and so we are looking forward to doing that and celebrating with them. So, uh, John, why don't you and Sienna and baby Joshua come? i got to reorganize everything here to get you, get you ready here. I'm going to put them on the spot. they got to stand the whole time I talk. So Now you know how I feel, all right? What's up, big boy? Crayons. Crayons. I always mistake Fruit Loops for crayons myself, so it, it's all good. But uh, as, uh, as we know, uh, when we have a baby dedication, uh, we're wonderfully you know, thrilled to do this, but it's also understood that it's not a baby dedication per se because... Joshua has no clue what's going on other than eating that crayon right now, all right? It's a mom and a dad dedication. Um, and, and I'll take it a step further. It's a family dedication, and it's a church family dedication. Uh, we all have a part in, in being a blessing and a help to, to this family, and especially to young Joshua. That I want to teach him the red crayons are better than the green crayons. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> anyways, look at that belt buckle. He's already learning and uh, knows what's going on. But um, I want to take you just quickly to a passage of Scripture, give you a couple of thoughts, and then we'll give them some things. But um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah, of course, was, was childless, and uh, she could not have a child, and she begged God for a child and asked him to give her a son. And she says this, For this child I prayed when God delivered and gave her that boy Samuel. She says, The Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Uh, as we think about a baby dedication, it's, uh, again, we're not forcing the baby to do anything. The baby doesn't understand. But what we as parents are doing is saying, Lord, you've given me this child. I'm giving him back. And whatever you want with his life, we're going to support that. We're going to push that. We're going to promote that in his life. Every year in the United States of America, there are about 6 million babies aborted. I thank God for the Supreme Court's decision just this last week. I know there's a lot of opinions on that I have for a variety of reasons. I'm thankful for that decision. But um, the U.S. population here is about 326 million. 56% of those claim to be associated with Christianity somehow, some way. But only 16% consider themselves committed Christians. 30%... Uh, no religion at all in our country, and that continues to climb. Very few kids today are growing up in committed Christian homes. Maybe marginal Christian homes, maybe a, a, occasional Christian homes, but committed Christianity is lacking. Hannah was committed. God gave her Samuel, and Samuel said, or, and Hannah said, God, I'll give him back, and he'll serve you with his life, and we're thankful for that. And So baby dedication, John, Sienna, is is more of John and Sienna dedication than anything. Um, eventually, in the, down the road, we're going to see what becomes of Joshua's life, but mom and dad will have a huge impact uh, in that decision and what he does with his life. And I just want to give you a couple thoughts here, and then i got a letter I want to read to Joshua. But um, we need to understand, first of all, that children are a gift from the Lord. They're not ours. They're not ours. They're on loan to us. We're supposed to train them and teach them and, and, and uh, uh, help them to learn about God and to grow. But they're not ours. Uh, they're to be given back to God. And, and that's the reality of, of, of our life as Christians especially. Uh, we give them back to God. Uh, they learn about God in the home first and foremost. Um, our church, John Sienna, we are here to help you. We are here to support you. We will do anything we can to help your family and little Joshua. But the bulk of the responsibility of spiritual leadership rests in the home. And uh, we'll support them all we can. But John and Sienna... Uh, we're going to help you. We're going to, we're going to encourage you and remind you that responsibility to challenge and to teach Joshua lies firmly in the home. And then we're just, we're just support. And we'll support you the best we can. But uh, we want you to know that this morning. And, and the instructions given to parents is to teach our children diligently. Uh, we see that in Genesis. We see it in Deuteronomy. Uh, teach our children diligently. Um, when you rise up, when you sit down, when you eat, whatever you do, teach your children uh, the importance of knowing God and having a relationship with Him. Uh, one thing that you'll do is this, and, and I'll say this, and I want to read a little letter for Joshua, but uh, if you teach your children properly uh, and you teach them about God and they begin growing in their own personal relationship with God, eventually you'll say like John said, I have no greater joy 
than to see that my children walk in the truth. And that's our goal for you. That's our prayer for you. And uh, we hope that you will uh, be willing to do that in Joshua's life as, as parents. Uh, I want to read a little letter that I prepared for Joshua. And we have a little, uh, I'll give you this stuff first here. But there's a little Bible, his first Bible uh, for him. We have a little dedication certificate as well. Um, I've already signed this. So John and Sienna, you have to sign this as well to, to show your commitment, okay? I'm going to give you that. And you guys can sign it last night for the service here. But I'll give you that. And I got one more thing here. And this is for Joshua, but he can't have it now. Okay, this is, for, this is for down the road. He wouldn't know what to do with it now except maybe eat it. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he'd be chewing on it. But anyway, so um, I'll read this. It's dated, of course, today's date, June 26, 2022. It says, Dear Joshua, I write to you on the day of your dedication at church. This is the day that your parents made a public statement of their desire to give you a Christian home. And it is our desire as a church to stand behind all of you as you try to live for God. Please know that on this day you were surrounded by your family as well as your church family. As you have been given this letter down the road and this package by your parents, it means you have reached a critical time in your life. I want you to know that whatever situation you find yourself in, God loves you and so do I. There are... uh Uh-oh. And so does the floor. (laughs) There uh, There are two coins in this package. Uh, Each one is a one-ounce silver U.S. Mint Buffalo Head coin. If this letter finds you at a place in your life when it's given to you that you are happy and prospering and serving the Lord, I want you to look at this beautiful uncirculated coin and see its beauty and take a moment to thank God for the blessing that he's given you with grace to get to this point in your life. The beautiful coin, unmarked and unscarred, is a symbol of your blessed life and has quite a lot of value in the collector market. However, if this letter finds you in a place of regret, I also want you to look at the other coin. You'll notice it's worn. It's got uh, some scars and some marks. Perhaps many pockets or hands have held it roughly. But I'm certain as long as this has been around, it's been used for good as well as for bad. But I want you to know this. It's still a pure silver coin. It's quite valuable still in the, in the collector market, even though it's damaged and rough. It has a damaged exterior. I want you to look at this coin and realize that is your life. Your potential is still great in the eyes of God. In fact, he compares his word to silver tried in a furnace of earth. Your life has been tried on this earth, but God still wants to use it for his good. You may have some tarnish or some damage on the outside, but you're still silver underneath. It's your future that matters, not your failures. If when you're given this package, I am still alive on this earth, I want you to know that you have a friend and a helper to either find your way back to God or to help you stay close to him, depending on your situation. If I'm in heaven, I know you have many other good people that you can go to. Joshua, I want to encourage you to live for God. Never quit. You're silver on the inside. And I want you to know that I loved you enough to invest in you. And I'm going to give this to his parents. And when the time is deemed necessary, I'm going to seal it, John, so Sienna doesn't steal the coins. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. When the the time is needed uh, to present that to him, uh, you will know. And uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing and a help to them, to him, and to you. And, of course, if we can help in any way, we want to be there for you as well. So uh, let's have a word of prayer as we dedicate uh, uh, Joshua uh, to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you this morning for this family. Uh, we thank you for John and Sienna. We thank you for their love for you. Uh, Lord, their, uh, their uh, desire to bring up a, a young child in a Christian home, Lord. And we're thankful for that. We pray that you will bless them, help them, strengthen them. Lord, it's not easy bringing up a child, let alone trying to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray that you'll give them wisdom, give them guidance and strength and patience. Uh, Lord, be with Joshua, Lord, as he develops into a young man. Uh, May he follow you truly with his heart and with his life. And may you bless him and bless his family, Lord, we pray. We give him to you today. Uh, The parents surrender, Lord, uh, him to you and ask you just to work and to have your perfect will in in your way done in his life. 
And we pray that we'll support that and we'll be a blessing to this family, we pray. We love you. We thank you for this family, for John and for Sienna and for baby Joshua. And we pray that you'll use them mightily in your will and in your way, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 John, Sienna. Thank you, God. And as they're making their way back to their seats, uh, church, I'll again just remind you, I know I said this a little bit, but uh, um, let's, let's be a help to them. Let's be a blessing to them. And let's be an encouragement to them. I know it's tough rearing children in today's age. And uh, so let's be all we can be to help them do what they need to do for the cause of the Lord as well. Okay? All right. Kathy, you come and you make some announcements, and then we'll sing again. There's just nothing better in the life of the church than a, a dedication of a child to the Lord and for us to dedicate ourselves to be a support to John and Sienna. It's, it's a wonderful time. So looking at your announcements, uh, we have the growth groups that are, are starting uh, next, or this coming Wednesday. You need to sign up for those groups. There are sign-up sheets out in the uh, lobby. Uh, there, the growth groups are actually... Um, going to be they're going to run for several weeks and there will be a light supper at 6 30 and then um, uh, the growth groups will meet from 7 to 8 in the here in the sanctuary deacons and trustees you're going to be meeting tuesday uh, july 5 at five o'clock in the church office uh, and we want to really thank uh, the deacons and the trustees for their willingness to serve our church uh, larry terry roger nolan charlie and cliff uh, willing hearts to serve in, in this capacity, and we're, we appreciate that. Ladies' dinner is coming up on July 14th. Uh, Heidi's going to be hosting that ladies' dinner in her home uh, with a special activity. She has a pool, did you know that? And we're going to do some swimming. So mark your calendar for Thursday, July 14th, 6 o'clock. You'll be bringing a dish to share. Uh, thank you to everyone who helped out at the work time yesterday. I assume there were lots and lots of projects completed or at least started and with completion in the near future oh sure if you were here working uh, stand up and let's see who all was was here helping get these projects done wonderful very good thank you so much thank you thank you uh, also, be sure to pick up your July-August copy of the Baptist Bread. They're available for you out in the lobby, a wonderful little devotional book for your uh, at-home devotions. The nursery volunteers for this week and next are there, uh, birthdays and anniversaries. We have choir practice today at 5 o'clock. Come and join us. It's wonderful. We have a good time, and uh, we have a few extra chairs there in the choir. So come and join us and uh, be a part of the choir and then, of course, evening service at 6 and 7 on Wednesday. Our next hymn is hymn 495, Jesus Loves Even Me. <clears throat> I am so glad that our Father in heaven Tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me whatever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I would flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. 
I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. And our next song is At Calvary in 492. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burning soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing Calvary. <coughs> Grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Very good. Our next hymn is hymn 389, Spirit of the Living God. <coughs> Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me. Presence, 
love divine cast out my fears. Mona, you forgot me, honey. <laughs> that almost became an a cappella special. <laughs> I'd have to tell you, our, our musicians, after a month of playing choir rehearsals and playing three services a week, sometimes it takes a toll on them. And, uh, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I'm kind of homesick for country to which I've never been before no sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter in Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids over to Junior Church at this time. They'll make their way next door. And while they're coming, or while they're leaving, while they're going, whatever they're doing, if you'll find in your Bible the book of Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. When you have found that, just look at the page to the left of it. And you'll be in Jude 20, 22, 23. All right. Just trying to help you. 
I said Jude, and some of you went, what? <laughs> We're going to start a series for the next few weeks. They will not be linked together necessarily as far as building upon each other. Uh, but we're going to look at the topic of go. And for the last uh, month or so in our Sunday school classes, we've been uh, seeing the importance of witnessing. We've been going through how to do that, how to contact people, how to start a, a conversation up and those types of things. And uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some, some very pointed things from Scripture that really teach us and show us our obligation to give the gospel to the lost. And uh, our growth groups on Wednesday nights will compound on top of our Sunday morning services. That's what we'll be referring to and going back to to study on Wednesday nights. So if you haven't signed up for a growth group, today's your last day to do so. Unless you join us partway through, you can do that as well. But uh, sign up out there if you would. And also, just so everyone is aware, if you haven't signed up and you do today or if you already are signed up, if you're planning to eat with us at 6.30, would you just maybe put like a little star by your name just so that we can make sure we have enough food for everyone and you're not eating breadcrumbs, all right? So if you could help us with that, we appreciate that. Uh, ladies, ladies, just so you know, for your ladies meeting coming up at Heidi's house, swimming is not uh, um, mandatory, okay? It's optional. And so I know some of you are like, I ain't going to go swim, so I'll stay home. Go anyways. Because it'll be good fellowship, okay? It always is. I know, you ladies. I even sit in my house. I hear you cackling all the way over there, Jackie. But uh, <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Thank you for the socks. <laughs> I treat you so well, don't I? <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so go anyways. Uh, you'll, you'll still have a good time. You always do. So, um, And then also, I wanted to say this just real quick before we get into the scripture. Um, those that helped at the work day yesterday, I know you stood up and we clapped for you earlier. And I, I just want to say, I do appreciate you so much. That was a huge blessing, a help. And you feel like maybe, maybe you say, well, I didn't do much. Everything you did was something that needed to be done that's been on the list for a little while. And we appreciate it. We got everything done other than one small job uh, that can be completed later on. It's not a big deal. It can be done very easily. But uh, we appreciate you so much. That was a good turnout. And uh, some of you spent hours uh, hours and hours doing what you did, and we appreciate that so much. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do appreciate that. And when we have another one down the road, we'll let you know, all right? And uh, hopefully you'll come back. Amen. But uh, we appreciate your help there. So did everybody find Revelation chapter 1? Did everybody look at the page beside it, which is the book of Jude? Just one small chapter, 25 verses. And this morning we're going to look at uh, the 22nd and 23rd verse. And we're going to look at the topic this morning of compassion makes the difference. Compassion makes the difference. If you're able to this morning, would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word as we read these two verses together? And uh, then we'll pray and you can be seated. Scripture says this, and if some have compassion, making a difference. Isn't that good to make a difference in people's lives? Uh, and of course, Scripture is teaching us here, compassion is one way we can do that. Verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, have, uh, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. Uh, compassion makes the difference. And specifically today, we're going to focus on the topic of compassion makes a difference in eternity. Compassion makes a difference in the lives of people in the area of heaven or hell and where they're going to spend eternity with their lives. And so let's look at that topic this morning. Compassion makes the difference. Let's pray together and uh, then we'll be seated. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and goodness. Thank you for the time we've had to be in your house, Lord, to worship you, uh, to praise your name through song, Lord, to uh, see another uh, a family dedicating a child to you. What a blessing that is. And Lord, it's just been good to be in your house today. And we're grateful for the opportunity we've had. We ask you now as we open your word for the next few minutes that you'll bless the preaching. Uh, may it be helpful to us, instructional, educational. Lord, may it just guide us and encourage and strengthen us, not just in our walk with you, but also in our desire uh, to share the gospel with the lost, Lord, I pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you with our lives. We ask you now, as always, if there's one that does not know you as our Savior, uh, whether they be in our service or watching our, our service online, uh, Lord, we pray today would be the day they recognize their need for you and how much you love them, that you gave your son to die for them. And they would trust you, Lord, as their personal Savior. Uh, we ask you now to bless the, the remaining moments of our service and this time of preaching. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning. Compassion makes the difference. What is compassion? Um, compassion, just before I kind of give you a definition or a description of it, uh, one thing we need to know about compassion is this. It is the prime key Factor or ingredient in being a witness for Jesus Christ. 
Uh, when I establish this thought of, of having compassion for souls, it motivates me to want to tell them about Christ. So, so it's a very key factor. Compassion comes from the Greek word elios, and it meaning, it meaning to have mercy or to show kindness by assistance. To show kindness by assistance. Um, compassion is not just an emotion. Compassion is much like we describe love. It is an action word. It, uh, it signifies that compassion is something we don't just say or express. It's something we, we do. We assist the object of our compassion. That's where the root word elios comes from. Another word used for compassion in scripture is uh, splank noise. Aren't you glad we don't have to say that word, right? Splank noise. And, and the meaning of that word is bowels. Bowels. Now, when you think of bowels, again, we're not uh, what we would typically think of today. That's not what it means. It's meaning the inner parts of a person, the hearts, uh, the lungs, the liver, uh, the upper intestines of a person is what it's referring to. The Greeks considered the word bowels or the splank noise, uh, this, this type of compassion, to mean more violent passions of anger and love. That's where they, that's what they use it for. The Hebrews considered it to mean tender affections like kindness. Mercy and compassion. Uh, this word is uh, used universally because it dealt with the feeling of love. It's a passionate or a strong love or anger, according to the Greeks. And the Hebrew says it's a love that then demonstrates mercy or grace or kindness towards somebody else. Larry, I'm going to ask you a question real quick back in the sound booth. Did I, I didn't move the camera, did you? Are we still zoomed in? You did? Thank you, sir. He wrote me a note to move it. Look, he, he wrote me this note to change the camera after Sunday school because we zoom in and then we zoom out for church and I've forgotten. If I start stepping over here, I, I get out of the picture. So not that anybody wants to see me, but uh, anyways. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, again, it's a, it's a, a word uh, uh, demonstrating love as an action that comes from within and is displayed without. Paul talked about compassion uh, uh, for the lost uh, that he had. And in 1 John 3, he, he talks about uh, uh, if he shut up the bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in you? If we're not willing to display compassion towards people, Paul questions our really desire to, 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 to love Christ and to have Christ in our life. Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. He says, Christ has affected me in such a way that, that my innards want to love you and show you and point you to Christ. The verb form of this word means to be moved with compassion. To be moved with compassion. You see the difference between having compassion and being moved with compassion? It's the verb form. It, it motivates you to do something. This, this verb form of compassion, this moving of me, it only occurs in the Bible three times. Three times. They're all in parables in the Gospels. Uh, other than talking about Jesus. When it talked about Jesus and his compassion, it was always that moved with compassion. But, but to normal, general people, uh, this, this thought of being moved with compassion, uh, motivated and in action taking place, is only three times in Scripture. Matthew chapter 18. You remember the master and had the servant that owed a debt? And he, he forgave him that great debt. That is the compassion that's described there. Uh, it illustrated God's compassion towards the sinner with our unpayable debt. You realize this morning when you are born into this world, you are born with a debt that you cannot pay. You are born with a, a debt of sin and you owe a payment through that sin. That payment is death in a place called hell, separated from God for eternity. But thanks God, he paid the debt for us. Amen. And that's, that's, that's what this is referring to, this compassion. That, that master forgave his servant of a debt that that, that that servant had no way to pay. That's Christ's compassion. That's God's compassion. It's also used in the story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son. Uh, the father that was waiting to, for his son to come home and welcome him. This illustrates God's compassion to the backslider as well as to the lost man. Amen? Aren't you thankful that at times in our life when we step away from God, God never steps away from us? Amen? Aren't you thankful that when I fail him, he doesn't fail me? Amen. And aren't you thankful that when, when the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart and you called upon him, he was faithful to, to, to save you and forgive you of your sins and give you home in heaven? That's his compassion. It's referred to in our lives in the prodigal son and the father. It's also shown in Luke 10 in the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Uh, uh, the two spiritual leaders of the time looked away and crossed the other side of the road. I don't want anything to do with it. But the man who probably everybody thought wouldn't be involved, the Samaritan, he came and he bound up that man's wounds, took him to the, to the inn, paid for his care and took care of that man. 
and it illustrates the right attitude every Christian should have towards the, the, the poor, the lost, and the needy. That's the illustration we have. Too many times as Christians, we see a need and we look away and say, I hope somebody else fills that. Oh, I'll pray about that. Hey, there are times when Christians need to be moved to action. That's compassion. That's compassion. Compassion, of course, originates with God. Uh, he has a heart of great love and compassion. Uh, his heart, by the way, do you know God's heart, not only does it rejoice with us, God's heart aches with us. When I hurt, he hurts. That's his compassion. That's his love for me. The Bible talks a lot about Christ's compassion. Uh, in Matthew chapter 9, he had compassion on the wandering multitudes. Aren't you thankful he had compassion when you were wandering? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Matthew 14, he had compassion on the sick and the afflicted. Ma Matthew chapter 20, he, he showed compassion to two blind men. Luke chapter 7, he showed compassion to the widow of Nain. And there are other instances in Scripture where God's compassion or Christ's compassion is pointed out. I hate to say it this morning, but the compassion that Christ showed and the compassion that we as Christians ought to have is greatly lacking in our churches today. It's greatly lacking in our circles of Christianity today. The, uh, the Chicago Suns um, Times Library, the newspaper library, has a special file labeled apathy. Apathy. And it shows in this file many instances uh, of indifference or, uh, or apathy or I just don't care amongst Americans. It's a staggering file. If you want to be depressed, read it. Okay? I want to point out, I'm just going to give you three quick illustrations from it, okay? In this file, there was a, in New York City, a mailman was shot by a sniper. He was in a building. He was shot by a sniper. He was ordered out of the lobby of the building by security because he was bleeding on their floor. In Oklahoma City, a woman gave birth unexpectedly on a city sidewalk. Bystanders turned their heads and walked away. Taxi drivers saw and sped away to avoid involvement. A nearby hotel refused to give her a blanket. Dayton, Ohio. A dozen people saw a lady drive her car into the Miami River. They watched indifferently as she climbed on the car's roof and shouted that she could not swim, please help. And she drowned that day. How Desperately, our world needs the message of Christ's compassion. In Christ's example of compassion, we find three sources, uh, three elements that teach us uh, the source, the heart, and the outcome of true compassion. That's what we want to look at. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38, it talks about Jesus and his compassion. It teaches us three things. He saw, he was moved, and he took action to assist the object of his compassion. As we think about Christ's compassion this morning, and we think about this fact that compassion makes the difference, what are the three key ingredients to compassion? Let me give you them this morning. Number one, number one, we have to visualize. We have to visualize. This is the first ingredient to Christ-like compassion. The master, Jesus himself, saw the hopeless state of people. He saw the hopeless state of the servant. Uh, the prodigal's dad saw the hopeless state of his son. The good Samaritan saw the, the hopeless state of this wounded man. Jesus, throughout his ministry, always saw the hopeless situation and said what? I'll step in and I'll help. Compassion is always prompted by vision. I've got to see it. Proverbs tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. I've got to have a vision. If I don't have a vision, I'll never have a burden. If I don't have a burden, I'll never have a goal. If I don't have a goal, I'll never establish a plan. If I don't establish a plan, I'll never pursue it. If I don't pursue it, I'll never experience fruit. If there's no fruit, the world perishes. It all starts with seeing. It all starts with visualizing. It all starts with seeing a need. In John chapter 4, Jesus reminded the disciples, uh, Say not there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. I say the field is white already unto harvest. Go and win them. Go and win them. We've got to see the need. We have to have visualize the compassion that we need for people. and Realize compassion makes a difference. It does not take you long or it should not take you long to stop and look at the world around you and realize we have great needs. The world is hurting. 
the lost are needy. Uh, Christianity is suffering. Uh, we have needs. Visualize this fact. There is spiritual poverty in our world today. Yeah, I know there's physical poverty. I, I understand that. There's financial poverty. I get that. There is spiritual poverty in our world today. The world is blind to the need of the, of, of the gospel. Visualize inner turmoil in the lives of people. Visualize hopelessness, aimlessness, a lack of peace, a lack of joy, a lack of contentment, a lack of purpose in the lives of unsaved people. Have you ever talked to an unsaved lost person and realized how depressed and how sad they are? And they're always looking for answers and they're looking for solutions. They're looking for happiness and peace and joy, but they're looking in the wrong places. I know that. I got to see that. I got to open my eyes. I've got to visualize this morning. Jesus saw the multitude and was moved with compassion. In order for my heart to be moved, my eyes have to be open. Amen? Think about this this morning. Think about this. We, we often say something like this. Well, so-and-so has a need. I will pray for them. So-and-so is lost. I will pray for them. That's great. I encourage you to do so. But here's our problem. We say, I'll pray. God's in control. God's going to do what God's going to do. So I'll just let God do what he do. I'll just say, I'll say my quick little prayer and I'll forget about it. Compassion says this. I see the need. Yes, I'll pray for it. Then I'll, I'll put feet to my action and, and I'll do something about it. Amen? My dad always used to say a need seen is an opportunity or an obligation or a job given. I open my eyes and I see the need and, and it motivates me then to do something about it. But I got to open my eyes first. I tell you, folks, I, our country is partly in the, in the situation it's in today because Christians for years have buried their heads in the sand, claimed separation of church and state. I'm not supposed to get involved. That's government. And God says, listen, I, I've got a plan. Follow my ways, not man's ways. You've got to get involved. I've got no right to complain about government if I don't vote. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I've got no right to complain about things if I won't do something about it when God stirs my heart about it. Amen. i got to visualize. We're not ostriches, folks. We don't get to stick our head in a hole and say everything's going to go away eventually. We've got to see things for what they are. I look at our world today. My heart breaks. I look at our small little community. We're, you know, we're not, you know, high crime, you know, Phoenix and that kind of, we're not multi, you know, billion population, but our community is hurting. There are needs. There are people who are lost. There are people who are broken. Uh, there are families who need help. There are people who just need somebody to invest in their lives. I have got to open my eyes this morning. Compassion makes the difference, but it starts with opening my eyes. Visualize. Visualize. Number two, agonize. Agonize. My vision will supply me with a burden that will then move me to show compassion. Uh, see, when I see the need, it ought to burden my heart. When I see the need, uh, it ought to move me with a brokenheartedness, an agony of lost souls, an earnest prayer on behalf of the lost souls, and a desire to do everything I can to reach those lost souls. Agonize. Moses in Exodus chapter 32 agonized. God had come. The, the, Moses was on the mountain. The people had built the golden calf under Aaron's direction. We're worshiping the golden calf. Remember, Moses comes down off the mountain and hears the noise and the junk going on. Comes in and finds out what's happened. Says, what in the world have you done? And God says, you know what? I'm just going to kill them all. And Moses begged God. Begged God. He said, God, forgive them. And if you have to punish anybody, punish me. Punish me. Moses agonized for the souls of his people. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 9, agonized for, for his people. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. He was used to agonizing for the sins of his people and begging God to forgive his people. Jeremiah said this, Oh, that my head were waters, 
and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep night and day for the slain of the daughter of my people. He agonized. When's the last time a lost loved one motivated you to tears? When's the last time you saw a need and it burdened you so much? You said, I gotta do something, God. I don't know what and I don't know how, but if you'll show me, if you'll help me, I'll do it. See, it's great to see, but that sight has to move me and, and burden me to the point where I agonize. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, agonized over Jerusalem. Agonize. It's a passion that is born from our compassion. John Knox, missionary of the past, said, Give me Scotland or I die. George Whitfield prayed, Give me souls, God, or take mine. David Brainerd, a fantastic missionary, said this, I care not where I go or how I live or what I endure so that I might help to save souls. When I sleep, I dream of them. When I awake, they are first in my thoughts. No amount of scholastic attainment, of able and profound exposition, of brilliant and stirring eloquence can atone for the absence of a deep, impassioned, sympathetic love for human souls. Agonize. When's the last time we just stopped and realized there are people we see every day of our lives that are lost without Christ. And because of that, they're on their way to an eternal separation from Him in a place called hell. And I have the answer, and I'll agonize over them, and I'll share the gospel. Visualize. See the need. The need is real. There's no denying the need. But will I allow that then to affect me and cause me to agonize over the need? You know, you ought to think about it. When you wake up in the morning, lost souls ought to be on your mind. When when you go to bed at night, lost souls ought to be on your mind. When when you go to work, lost souls ought to be on your mind. Uh, When you have the opportunity to, to go shopping, as dreadful as it is for most of us, lost souls ought to be on your mind. I'd enjoy shopping more if I knew I was going to give the gospel to somebody. Amen agonize agonize it ought to bring us a a a a tremendous burden to my heart it ought to break me to the point where i'll say lord whatever it takes use me use me to help fulfill the need compassion we have to visualize we have to agonize number three number three we have to evangelize when jesus saw a need he was moved with compassion And then he acted. Then he acted. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. He saved lost souls. Don't just see the need for the person and feel for the person. Act upon the situation. It starts with visualizing. Uh, Compassion, that's where it starts. I see needs. It then then is compounded by... by, uh, agonizing over those needs and agonizing how I can help. But then it comes to fruition or it finishes or it completes itself by evangelizing. I see the need of the lost. It burdens and breaks my heart. And then it motivates me to say, I've got the answer. I'll do something about it. I'll share the gospel. I'll share the gospel. Do you realize, Christian, we are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, We are called to represent Jesus as ambassadors for Christ here in this foreign country that we live in until God calls us home. We are instructed to do that. That means I got to put it into action. I got to evangelize. I got to witness. See a need. Get burdened by the need and then do something about the need. That's compassion. That's compassion in a nutshell. D.O. Moody, many years ago, he He saw a picture uh, painted of a woman being rescued from the stormy sea. And she had both hands wrapped around a cross. And they were pulling her up out of the sea. And he said, that really impacted me. But he said, years later, I had a greater impact. I saw a very similar picture painted. A woman was being rescued from a stormy sea. With one hand, she was hanging on to that cross, pulling her up. And with the other hand, she was lifting another person up out of the waves. D.L. Moody said that picture clearly teaches us the responsibility of every Christian to help others see Jesus. 
You know, I'm thankful in my life that there was somebody willing to tell me about Jesus. I'm thankful there was somebody willing to sacrifice their precious time and say, here's what the Bible says about heaven and about knowing Christ as your Savior and about going to heaven and knowing God, heaven is your eternal. I'm glad somebody was willing to evangelize. I'm glad somebody was willing to say, hey, I've already got Jesus. I'm willing to share him. Amen. You realize Jesus is not something to be stuck in our pockets and held onto with selfish fists? Jesus is something to be distributed. Jesus is something to be shared. It's the little girl, I said it before. She says, Jesus, Jesus is in my heart, but he's so big, he's got to stick out somewhere. Amen? Amen. I evangelize. I share him. I realize the need of the lost. It, it, it burdens me, but then I do something about it, and I share the gospel. I share the gospel. T.J. Bach was saved as a student in Copenhagen, Denmark. He was walking down the street one Sunday afternoon. A young teenage boy crossed the street towards him, greeted him, and handed him a gospel tract. T.J. Bach took the track from that young boy and crumpled it up in his hands, stuck it in his pocket and said, mind your own business, boy. The young boy did not respond. Instead, he turned away from T.J. Bach. And he bowed his head and his tears streamed down his face. He begged God, whatever it takes, God, save this man. Bach watched that young boy cry on the sidewalk and pray for him. And he realized that young boy gave his money to buy that track. He gave his time to cross the road and give it to me. And now he stood here in public and wept for me. And begged in God, uh, to God in prayer to save me. That young man's compassion towards Bach... And his crude behavior and his mean spirit brought deep conviction upon T.J. Bach. Half an hour later in his hotel room, Bach reached into his pocket. And he pulled out that gospel track and he smoothed it out. And he began to read it before he even finished. He fell to his knees and he begged God to forgive him and to be his savior. The following song as a result of that, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save, rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for the labor the Lord will provide, back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wanderer a savior has died. Compassion makes a difference. Church, I want to challenge you this morning. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. You see, you're here this morning in a crowd of people with the, on the same page, with the same purpose, uh, worshiping the same God. We're all, you know, hey, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya because we're all on the same team. But as soon as you walk out their doors, there's a huge, vast mission field waiting for you. Whatever city you may live in, whatever part of the city, whatever neighborhood you might live in, they need Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes open when you leave Calvary Baptist Church. When you pull out of the parking lot, thank you, amen. When you leave the parking lot, keep your eyes open. There are needs everywhere. Uh, this this weekend, Friday Fellowship, we had we had two people stop, uh, one not on his own power, one by his own power, that had needs that God providentially brought into our pathway for a certain purpose, for such a time as this, and we helped with a need. But you got to have your eyes open. You, you, you got to be looking. Uh, we, we've got we've to stop burying the head in the sand. We've got to stop saying, well, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. My eternity settled. Oh, yay, hallelujah. Instead, realize there's millions around us that are lost. Visualize. Open our eyes this morning in an agonize. Allow what we see 
to affect our hearts. Some of you will never forget what took place on 9-11, 20 some years ago. I remember after that took place, seeing the pictures that came out of children killed or injured very badly from the situation that took place when the towers fell. And I remember how that affected my heart. Do you realize that in spite of the, 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 the vast and drastic injuries those kids faced, do you realize that doesn't hold a candle to spending eternity separated from God in a place called hell? It doesn't hold a candle. And as much as that stirred and moved my heart, how much more should a lost soul move me and cause me to agonize and even weep over someone in prayer? When I see and when I feel, then I have to move. See, compassion is not one of those elements. Compassion is all three combined. I see, I hurt, I ache. It causes pain. But that motivates me then to do something about it. And I move on the sight and on the feeling evangelize the need of the world is not for a better government system the need of the world is not for gas prices to drop although I wish they would you know the need of the world is not for uh, some new uh, global economic stimulus package the world for the need is not the new green deal the need for the world is very simple it's Jesus it's Jesus And the sooner I begin seeing that and allowing that to cause me to agonize over it, hopefully the more it will motivate me then to share him with others. Christ-like compassion. Love in action. Don't don't take this the wrong way. We have our food pantry out here that feeds, I can't even tell you how many. Najaya might be able to tell you how many hundreds of people that it helps weekly. Food's a great need. Clothing can become a great need. I, I, I get that. From what I understand, I don't have to deal with this, but baby formula is a problem right now. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't deal with it, but it's a need. There's nothing wrong with helping with those needs. Okay? But here's what I need to understand. The primary need is still Jesus. And if I'm going to help them with food, if I'm going to help them pay a light bill, or I'm going to help them what, what you fill in the blank, that's great. But don't miss the opportunity to help them with Jesus as well. Sometimes the food, the clothing, whatever, might open the door and build that rapport and, and give you that established uh, reputation with that person that they trust you and so on. I get all that. But don't miss the boat on sharing Jesus. Because he, he is the answer to all needs. Keep your eyes open. Let it affect your heart. I, I get I get weary of it's, it's usually men, I'm sorry. I get weary of Christian men who I'm too I'm, I don't cry. Sissies cry. Then I guess Jesus was the biggest sissy of all. See, it doesn't take a man not to cry. It takes a man to cry. Lost souls ought to move you to tears. It ought to cause agony in our hearts. Realizing I've been given a gift that hundreds of people don't have, but yet hundreds are searching for. And I can share that with them. And if I don't, what will happen to them? I ought to agonize over that. Visualize, agonize. But do something about it. Evangelize. Tell them about Christ. See, Pastor, I haven't been to the class. I don't know how to do it. Listen, listen. There's no magic formula. Hand somebody a gospel track. It's got the gospel on it. Tell somebody what Jesus did for you when he saved and changed your life. 
Share your testimony. Every one of you has a testimony if you're born again. Share it. Share it. You got you, Compassion is not complete without all three steps. Will you see the need this morning? Yes, even in our little community, there are great needs. Will you allow it to affect your heart and agonize over it? And then will you allow that to motivate you to do something about it? Evangelize. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And if some have compassion, making a difference. You know, you may not be able to do certain things you used to do when you were younger. You may not be able to do physical things that other people can do. But let me tell you something. Every single person in this room can make a difference. One of the ways we can do that is with compassion. Compassion. Will you make a difference? It's going to require compassion. Compassion. Visualize, agonize, and evangelize. Will we allow that to affect us like it did Christ and others in Scripture? So that we're effective for the cause of Christ while we're here on earth. Will we go? Father, Lord, I don't know the need this morning. I don't know who may be struggling with one or all three or any of these points or thoughts present. I don't know. I know, Lord, as I prepared the message and reviewed the message and studied the message, I know that I can do better. Lord, I figure if I can do better, maybe others can. And Lord, I pray you'll just take the message and, and hit a home run with it in our life. May it hit its mark. And uh, Lord, may your will be, be uh, uh, fulfilled through the preaching of your word. Lord, help us to see the need of the lost around us. Help us, Lord, to be motivated and moved by it. Agonize over it and then move to, uh, to do something about it, Lord, and to tell people about Christ. Lord, it can be done in so many different ways, in so many different forms. Help us just to be diligent, Lord, and, and be aware of opportunities that you give us to share the gospel. Stir our hearts, God. Lord, if we won't be busy about one of the things that is the greatest thing upon your heart, which is the lost, if we as a church won't be diligent and busy about it, Lord, how can we expect your blessings in other areas? Lord, I say we can't. We've got to be obedient. We've got to be witnesses for Christ and evangelize the lost. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed, no one's looking. We'll just have a, a brief invitation, sing a song, and we'll be done. You're sitting here today in our service, and you'd say this, Pastor, I saw my need. I saw the need in my life, and I needed a Savior. And there's a day in my life where I trusted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And preacher, if I were to die today, I'm on my way to heaven. I don't hope I'm getting there. I don't think I'm getting there. I know I'm getting there. And it's not by my church or by my works or my baptism. It's because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And preacher, if I were to die today, I'm on my way to heaven. And I know that for sure. Would you do this? Nobody's looking. Just, just slip your hand up. I just want to rejoice with you. Amen. Amen. Good. Hands all over. Good, 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 good. You can put them down. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're here this morning. You'd say this. Uh, Pastor, I... I, I I couldn't honestly raise my hand. I'd like to know heaven's my home forever. I'd like to know Jesus is my Savior. But I just don't know. I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? Listen, I'm not going to call your name. I'm not going to embarrass you. Could I pray for you? Could I, if you will, agonize to the Lord for you? You say, preacher, that's me. I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you do this? No, again, nobody's looking. It's between you and God. Would you do this? Would you just slip your hand up, slip it right back down? I want to pray for you in just a minute. I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? Just slip it up, slip it right back down. Thank you. I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? All right. One last question. Christian, I typically say for a question like this, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you this morning. How are we in the area of compassion? you hear this morning, you'd say, preacher, would you pray for me? Maybe I haven't been seeing properly. Maybe I haven't been moved, agonizing. Maybe I just haven't, I haven't been evangelizing. 
I need work in one of these areas or all of these areas. Preacher, would you, would you pray for me? Said, again, between you and God, I'm going to pray for you in a minute. But would you pray for me? God, I, I, need, I need help in this area. And that's me. Would you do this? No one's looking. Again, just, just slip your hand up. Slip right now. I'll pray for you just a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Hands all over the place. If we're honest with ourselves this morning, every hand should go up. Because I absolutely need help in all three of these areas. The question now is this, as we close our song and close our service with song, you raised your hand or you didn't. God spoke to your heart. Here's the thing. Do something about it. It does me no good to say, yeah, I, I need help, and then to do nothing about it. Do something about it. We close our service with a song to give you a chance for action or response. You can kneel, sit right where you're at. You can use an altar if you'd like. It doesn't matter. But as we sing, use that time of invitation to say, Lord, you spoke. I'll settle it with you. Lord, if you'll help me with whatever area you raised your hand about or didn't, I need help. Get his help today. Let him have his way. Let him have his way. Compassion makes a difference. Father, bless our invitation. Now you've seen hands that have been raised. You know our hearts and our minds. Lord, you know exactly what we need in this area, in either one of these points or all of these points. You know exactly what we struggle with and how we need help. Help us, God. Help us, first of all, to be transparent and real enough with you to say, I need help. God, strengthen me in this area. Help us to come before you. We know you know our hearts and our minds anyways. But help us to own up, Lord, to what we need. Help us to come for you, come to you then for that need and allow you to work in our hearts and our lives today. Give us a burden. Help us to see. Help us to agonize. And then help us to do something about it and witness for the, to the lost, we pray. We'll thank you for what you do now as we close our service through invitation. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand together with me this morning? We're going to close our song. I surrender all. As we sing it this morning, let's mean it this morning. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer this morning. And uh, we'll, we'll be dismissed. Uh, Andy, would you close this morning, please?